Welcome to the Autism and Neurodiversity Podcast. We're here to bring you helpful information from leading experts and give you effective tools and support. I'm Jason Grigla, a licensed counselor and founder of Techie for Life, a specialized mentoring program for neurodiverse young adults. And I'm Debbie Grigla, a certified life coach. And maybe most importantly, we're also parents to our own atypical young adults. Hello, hello, and welcome to this episode of Autism and Neurodiversity with Jason and Debbie. Today, I'm going to be talking about the rough couple weeks I've had, and I'm not going to dump on you, and hopefully when we're done, you won't feel more drained, as is the case when, when someone talks about their hard weeks, but I just realized that I was feeling fairly burned out, and... I was trying to understand, first of all, what I was going through and understand my situation. And the first thing I thought was, I don't like feeling burned out. I shouldn't feel burned out. I'm supposed to be able to manage my emotions and my resources and my energies and never feel like I get burned out. So I'm intentionally choosing to let myself have a bit of a pity party and dive into my emotions for a minute so that then I can at least honor them and respect them for what they are and then understand it to get out as opposed to, I can't feel this. I shouldn't feel this. I shouldn't be in that place. And I realized that I'm, I'm managing my burnout. And I realized that a lot of my burnout comes from trying to help manage about 30 students burnout and about 20 employees burnout. And I'm trying to manage and help at least 50 parents and their burnout. And it's just exhausting sometimes. And I was trying to understand where my frustration was coming. And I think it came down to a fairly obvious practical reason that's been right in front of my face. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. It's that the burnout of my employees, my mentors, and my parents is largely focused on expectations and how simple it is to say, hey, change your expectations so that you don't burn out and how hard it is to do it because of how sophisticated of a process and a balance and a dance that that actually is. And the the lack of consistency in growth and development and performance and how they meet my needs or never meet my needs or only meet my needs sometimes and sporadically is just so hard. It's just inconsistent and it's almost like I have to have no expectations, but if I have no expectations, then I get stuck in the place of being complacent. And a part of my actual job that I'm paid to do is to help our students progress and develop. And so if I care too much, I get burned out. If I don't care enough, then nothing changes and everyone is comfortably stuck and therefore comfortably miserable. So it's this, there's this constant dance between what I hope and what I want, what I expect. And it kind of reminds me of the old adage that a person who earns $10 and spends 12 is miserable, but the person who earns $8 and spends seven is happy. Um, I'm reminded of expectations of marital couples where couples who are in all outward performative ways are doing amazing things in their lives and for each other as, as a couple And yet, because of expectations being unmet, because of unrealistic expectations or too high of expectations, then the couple is is actually miserable. Um, Whereas there's actually a lot of couples who have low expectations and don't do nearly as much and accomplish nearly as much, even for each other and themselves, but they're they're satisfied and even happy because they have uh, lower expectations. So the point isn't to have low expectations. I think the point is to intentionally decide what are realistic expectations 
and then shoot for 80% of that and be thrilled that you hit your mark as opposed to frustrated that you didn't. So here's one of the, the problems. There's a fallacy that those that we love and work with who are neurodivergent, that there will be an ability to be consistent. And that is one of the biggest expectations that we have as neurotypicals because of how we experience developmental growth and maturity and adulting. It's about expectations that we have as a society when and how people should do things. And we base it off norms and we base it off typical and averages. And even if we consciously know that the mentee that we're working with and trying to help support that their timeline is different, we've heard it a hundred times that their timeline is different. It is nearly impossible for me to always let go of the shoulds of timelines and expectations because that's how my brain works. And one of the biggest parts of the disability side for neurodiversity, and it would be a disability for anyone, but it's fairly common here, is that just because they could do something for one day or one time or one month or even five months, that they would be from then on consistent in doing it moving forward like a typical person would. So the biggest danger there is that we often have assumptions and therefore expectations, and then we're disappointed. An example of that would be if we have behavioral interventions that look like external motivators, where we get them to do things because they need it, they want it, they agree to it, they even ask for it, and we help make it happen because it's so important, and then they either don't value it, they don't stick to it, or they sabotage it completely, and it just doesn't work. And we know that even with with typicals, that getting them to do something might not result in actual growth, but oftentimes getting them to do something like I spoke about in my last podcast, adding my flame to their wet wood until they self spark and stay lit on fire and they're burning for themselves. That That is the goal. And sometimes we have to prime the pump and, and get them to do a behavior. For example, getting them to try a new food that you really think that they would enjoy if they gave it a shot. And, you know, it might take 10 or 20 times of trying it and then they finally get past their rigidity and let themselves actually taste it versus just flippantly reactively say, no, I'm not going to like it. I knew I wouldn't like it. I had already made up my mind. And so it was done. And then they actually do like it. And then you can actually take them out to restaurants to eat instead of leaving them at home or having to stop at McDonald's to get chicken nuggets while you go out to eat somewhere. And that's, (laughs) that's a good goal. We want them to have Um, a more rich life experience and be more open to more activities. Um, We have our students try jet skiing on a lake in the summer because most of them are afraid of it and it's different and it's new and it's scary. And we want them to see that they can. And when they don't, when they don't like it, they don't have to do it again, but we want them to try it. And many of them realize they actually really like it. So we, we keep throwing experiences hoping that something will stick. And a lot of times it doesn't. And sometimes it does external motivators. And that's the danger in being a mentor is if we're standing above them in a, in a power differential and trying to get them to do something, typical brains can see what you're trying to do for them. And even us giving them external consequences or incentives and bribes, they can say, okay, it's it's worth it for me to try it, and I'm going to try it on for size, see if I like it. Um, even though I don't want to work, I'm going to go to work and get a paycheck is what a typical brain looks like. Um, a lot of our students are living so much in the moment that that's nearly impossible, and it takes a lot more growth to get them there. And I want to talk about some of those belief patterns and thinking patterns. 
So a typical brain will say, I don't want to go to work, but I definitely want the paycheck, so I'm going to go to work. And they own going to work, even though they would rather not work because they want the paycheck. That requires higher thinking. And it's the same with brushing our teeth. It's the same with cleaning our rooms. It's the same with investing in relationships. So even the highest functioning um, autists or neurodivergence or the, the seemingly most typical of autists, um, to my dismay and utter bewilderment, will just quit a job reactively, even though it's a great job. They worked really hard to get it. They actually have a lot of good friends. And after one bad day or experience, they'll just quit and be done because in the moment it was no longer worth it. And they don't see the past and they don't see the future. They just see in the moment, I am not happy with this job and I clearly don't want to be here. Therefore, it's logical for me to quit this job. Another example I, I see all the time because of the way their brain works, where expectations are undermined, even their own expectations, by the way, not, not just ours. They, they really do want to go to college and they really are enjoying learning or they're enjoying the friendships or just being out of the basement and in the light and walking around campus can be an amazingly positive experience. And when they're tired in the morning and the alarm goes off in the moment, they just can't see the benefit of getting up and it feels too comfortable to just stay in bed. So they do. And it sabotages what they really need in the long term for what they want in the moment. And that's one of the problems with expectations. Um, that is not to say that they are lazy. Technically, it's irresponsible and immature. And at the same time, it's autism. So it's just the way their brain works. They don't see the past and the future and take that into account. So I don't think we can judge um, like we would a normal young adult who really can see the future and the past and still just chooses to do something different. But even then, I, I think I'm coming to believe that all of us are just doing the best that we can. And, and if there's a reason that we choose to do something that's self-destructive, we need to figure out what that reason is and quit judging it. So our job is to create an environment where they want to do things, not to make them do things. We've talked about that before. And even then, when we set up a great environment that they say they need, that they have input on, that they want, that they're excited about, they're even a part of planning it, and it actually goes well and works, I'm still shocked. And this is where some of my burnout comes from because I have expectations that the very next day or the next week, they will just walk away from it. And I cannot for the life of me understand why a lot of the time. Um, I, I think it comes down to a lot of factors. Um, a lot of it is how they meet their needs in the moment. And there was an interesting example. There's a, a university that's building a building space on their campus for neurodivergence and they're spending a lot of extra money, over a over million dollars on special lighting that's autism friendly, paint schemes, architecture, anything and everything that would be what right now the community, the autistic community is saying is important and necessary for an autism friendly environment. And I still think it's going to be a big fail. I can't imagine it actually succeeding. Those, those aren't their needs and what we've been seeing. And, and I think those are needs for some people. The university is actually trying to cater to what we would consider level one autistic or high functioning autist, previously Asperger's and other ADHD, Tourette's type students. And Although fluorescent lights buzzing can be annoying and hard for them, I've witnessed them walk through the absolute worst 
environments and do things that they would never have chosen to do on their own just to be with some peers that were fun and charismatic and social just to be with a cute guy or a cute girl just to be with someone who is creating a social activity they would much rather hang out and get those needs met than have a lot of money and time and resources spent on the physical environment and so all of our logic goes out the window when we understand that they are trying to meet their needs their basic needs are the same as ours and one of their needs is to be comfortable they are so often all day long uncomfortable in their own skin that just always seeking a place of balance and comfort and okayness and lack of anxiety and stress becomes kind of their goal and that is so opposite of us trying to create an environment where they are out of their comfort zone but not overwhelmed uh, every choice obviously comes with a benefit of some sort for every person no matter what they choose if an addict chooses to reuse their drug and go back on their drug there's a benefit for them or they wouldn't do it every every choice that we can see that we do or someone else does that is self-destructive to the person who chose it there was a valid logical reason to do it for autists for example there's something called pathological demand avoidance and even if everything about a certain activity or performative thing like attending a job or doing something functioning that will benefit them if there's a perception that someone else expects them to do it or even wants them to do it the need to make their own choice overwhelms the benefit of the choice itself and they will literally choose to not do it just to spite the other person or at least that's how it feels when in reality they're just holding on to this very rigid black and white belief that I will only do things that are my choice because I want to and if other people are a part of the equation I will not do it because I need to be making my own choices and living my own life and that's an example of a very black and white rigid thinking pattern that destroys functionality and adulting so the lack of normal accomplishments and timelines and when they do something that is self-promoting responsible and mature and then they don't keep doing it it's a it's a clear place where autists and other neurodivergent young adults have a real disability some of the reasons that i don't think i've mentioned include things like they don't see the big picture they just don't see it it's not their fault they can't comprehend it they can't understand it they can't remember cause and effect of choices they can't learn from their past and apply it to the present they can't anticipate the future and act accordingly in the moment anticipating outcomes is just not on their radar and so it is a disability so another reason is when they try something new and it isn't fun immediately they give up or if it's too hard immediately they quit and they forget the reason that they chose to try it in the first place even if they had the ownership they very quickly decide in the moment i don't like it it's not worth it i'm done it's really hard to change our brains and it's even harder for those who are neurodivergent to change their brains they just don't develop the same and it takes a lot more work repeti um, re repetition consistency and so the the resilience just isn't there and they they can quit so quickly so you know no wonder i'm feeling burned out because if i in my most subconscious part of my brain am assuming that they will get it after the fourth or fifth time but it might be the 10th or 20th time or they may never get it and if i think my quality of life is based on them actually getting it as opposed to creating the environment where they could get it then i'm going to be disappointed and frustrated and burned out 
we'll talk about that more in a minute as a part of our suggestions at the end of this. So sometimes the worst part for me is to watch them throw away really great things that really would benefit them and meet their needs. And I, I'll sit and, and be with them as they're lonely and they cry because they don't have relationships. And then literally the next day, they'll sabotage and undermine the relationships that they so desperately need. It's In some ways, it's kind of like, que sera, sera. It, it, it's quick in, quick out, without any understanding or remembering or valuing all the resources that they or others put into creating the opportunity to get their needs met. That is so hard. So, you know, easy come, easy go is kind of um, a personal attribute of neurodiversity. I'm surprised how often someone who is picked on or unjustly bullied can let it just roll off their, their back like water off a duck. And obviously there's other times where one of our students or mentees will still be obsessively holding on to that time in fifth grade where so-and-so did this and now it has become my whole identity and it's all I focus on is, is that, you know, so-and-so was mean and I was bullied and therefore yada, yada, yada and, and all these things. So that happens as well. Um, I'm often surprised when a person who's uh, neurodiverse can walk away from addictions that we really thought would be impossible. And then other times, there's nothing that any intervention can do with an addiction or obsessive compulsive behavior that no external force or even learning on, on the neurodivergence part is going to help them overcome that that obsessive compulsive behavior until a lot more things change. So there are times when change happens and I just have quit trying to expect when that will be. And one of the questions parents ask me all the time is, do you think they're going to be ready by this date? Do you think they'll ever be capable of this thing do you think a year in your program is going to actually work? I don't even know how to answer those questions. I don't know what work means, what it means to you, what it means to your student, to your child. I don't know what they'll be capable of. And if I focus on outcomes and performative things, I know I get burned out very quickly. And it's so ineffective once I start getting sucked into the mindset that I need to get them to dot, dot, dot. I need them to accomplish these things for me to feel good about myself as a mentor and a business owner and a therapist. So when I have expectations, I'm giving away my power. I'm spending my resources in the wrong places and as soon as I start focusing on accomplishments as the connection to my job satisfaction, I've chosen to be miserable and my approach will change. And so many times as a parent, I want to jump in and help make sure that the student gets a certain grade or help make sure that they attend a function where I become a huge flame added to their wet wood, assuming that once they attend, then they'll want to keep attending. And once in a while that's true, but most of the time that's not true. Most of the time, if I do a really big push, it doesn't result in a big developmental leap forward. I'm always shocked when the developmental leaps happen. And it's never when I can anticipate it. So these wild card growth developmental things kind of reminds me of pulling a big weight on a pallet and it doesn't just slide forward as I'm pulling on the rope. I pull on the rope, pull on the rope, and the rope stretches and flexes and eventually enough force gets through the rope to the pallet that the pallet will lurch forward a foot or two and then stop and I haven't changed in how much I'm pulling, but the actual movement of the weight on the pallet is jerky and unpredictable. 
And sometimes we'll move an inch and then freeze. And then sometimes we'll move three or four feet and then freeze. And I'm, I'm always going to be miserable if the lack of progress of that pallet and the lack of consistent forward motion isn't happening because it's out of my control and there's nothing I can do about it. We play family games. And when my son with autism comes over, he is a complete wild card in our expectations. And I have tried to let go of all of my expectations and assumptions that I think I know what someone's thinking. I think I know what they're going to do. And when Lee comes and plays Risk or any strategy game, Settlers of Catan is a fun one for us. If there's any strategy involved whatsoever, I can't even begin to comprehend how he thinks and why he thinks and why he does what he does. If I ever try, I am always wrong. So I have stopped predicting, stopped even trying to manage him, which actually in a lot of ways makes a strategy game miserable because in risk, you typically want to win the game and everyone's looking for the same conquering strategy. But Lee sometimes will just get bored and, and just attack someone and go all out just because he wants to roll the dice a lot. Um, or sometimes his strategy is so nonsensical that it just throws everyone else's strategies in complete disarray. And to be honest, I like to play strategy games without him. And I would rather have him there than not. So when we do play strategy games, I just accept that he's a wild card. And actually, a lot of times it's fun because Lee determines who wins. And it's never him. Like, he doesn't ever get to win the game. But by taking out people randomly and without logic, he just decides who wins the game. And it's so haphazard and unexpected that we end up just enjoying enjoying it and going with it and not being frustrated because we change our expectations. We've decided that having him there and being a part of the game is more important and the goal and not the strategy of who can win the game. But there is a time to play the game for strategy. And I think that's important as well. So choosing to have our needs be about the outcomes is a burnout for me. And I've been trying to help my mentors and my employees at my job not get burned out because they have hopes and expectations that all of the work they're putting in comes with a specific result. And I keep going back to that principle that you are being paid to create an environment, not to realize outcomes. You are being paid and rewarded to be there for them and build relationships of influence. And it is great when they develop and have a, a leap forward. And yet we have almost no control over when and how that happens. We have some. And yet sometimes the wet wood is so wet that no matter how much flame you add, they're not going to be self-lit and self-sparking and stay lit on their own. So when we martyr ourselves for the sake of a child that burns us out because we have expectations about what the outcomes will be, that's when I find that I'm miserable and I resent and I'm useless to everybody. So to get out of my rut this week, I'm letting myself have a pity party for a day or two and say, you know what? I have a hard job. Emotionally, I get exhausted. I care a lot. And I wouldn't trade that for the world and it's worth it. And now it's time to get up and refocus my perspective into a place where I can control the outcome, which means I can control that I created the environment that was maximized for success. I created a relationship that maximized influence and I stopped focusing on the outcome so that I didn't burn out. There's a hundred reasons why our loved ones who are neurodivergent struggle with development. And I don't think it's their fault. I don't think it's their choice. I think they're always doing the best that they can. They're always seeking what we do, which is to feel good, 
we all want to feel good. How we feel good and what is sustainable feel good is the problem, obviously, because playing video games all day feels good, but really is just comfortably miserable in the end. But it feels better than being overwhelmed and rejected from typical peers. So, of course, I'd rather be on the computer if that's the choice between the two. So, a couple of suggestions. Expect the unexpected and let it go. And let go of your need for outcome. Uh, let go that your needs have anything to do with them performing. Allow for the process of the mentee or, the, or your child and have that be what feels really good. That I am adding my best self to the equation with no expectation of outcome. That's exactly what parenting is. So this is just good parenting principles. I will do everything in my power to help mentor and connect and influence without it burning myself out. And that's my next suggestion. If I've burned myself out as a martyr because my child requires so much more than what I perceive others' children to require, then I'm going to be useless and not, along, not around for the long haul. Sometimes it's lazy to martyr ourselves for a cause because maybe if we just martyr ourselves and get burned out and quit we don't have to keep up the race we don't have to endure we don't have to run a marathon we can just get it over with yeah that is a very nice thought and yet our neurodiverse loved ones our nonverbal learning disorder teenagers and young adults our artistic friends and nieces and nephews they need us for the long haul they need lifelong relationships and mentoring. And that's no different than any of us. It's just that with expectations that are not matching up with the situation, we somehow get burned out. So take care of yourself. Because without a safety net and without you around, your loved one will struggle and they will suffer. Be their cheerleader. Be their executive functioning and do it in a way that is sustainable. Your marriage comes first, your relationship with yourself comes first. If you invest everything into your child, that puts an amazing amount of pressure and expectation on them and they will actually start to resent it. They will start to feel responsible for your happiness. They will start to feel the burden and the pressure and it will actually paralyze them the more you help. So we've talked about staying out of the equation when the time is right. We've talked about how all we can do is add our flame to their wet wood as long as we can sustain it without it being destructive to us. And eventually the wood dries out and starts to burn on its own or it doesn't. Whether it does or doesn't isn't the thing that keeps us happy and at peace with ourselves. What keeps us as mentors happy and sustained and fulfilled is knowing that we've done all we can to provide an environment and a relationship of influence where they have the most opportunity to maximize success and learn and grow and leave the outcomes for another day as long as we're comfortable and at peace knowing that we've done what we can and that requires agility we have to change and shift and adjust and sometimes we have to step back and sometimes we have to move forward. It's a dance. We don't come, we don't become complacent where we just stop caring. We just learn how to care the right amount. But that's an ebb and flow and a dance and a process. And I'm not perfect at it, but the principles are there to guide us. And I think that's what I wanted to share with you today. I hope this was helpful. It was for me. Thanks for letting me vent. I'm going to avoid burnout and help people where I can and not take it on my shoulders that other people are learning their process of balancing and sustaining as well. Thanks for joining us. And we will keep talking about subjects that are really important to this process. Thanks and have a great day. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Autism and Neurodiversity with Jason and Debbie. If you wanna learn more about our work, Come visit us at jasondebbie.com. That's J-A-S-O-N-D-E-B-B-I-E.com. dot